All right, here we are, another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kader, and today we are joined by my buddy here. We've been trying to get this on the books for probably a good maybe two or three weeks. Yep. Simon Beckett, how are you, buddy? I'm fantastic. How and are you? I'm doing fantastic. And Simon actually comes from Pivot Turn Property Management. Yep, that's right. I that's... got that right. Pivot Turn. Where does the name come, Pivot Turn? Where did, like, how did that come up to fruition? For oh, you I love telling this story. So Pivot Turn came from, well, first of all, the idea came to me in a shower, mm -hmm. right? You know, you shower thinking, your shower thoughts. It hit me and I was like, that's it. Now, you have to understand why it hit. And I went, oh, that's amazing. I come from a dance background. Mm -hmm. So I am currently not as much of a performer anymore, but a teacher and a choreographer. And I teach hip hop, urban dance, house, popping is my big one, uh, hip hop, uh, old school, new school, that kind of thing. And so that's the side hustle now. But Pivot Turn is a dance move. So it's a step forward, a 180 degree turn at its base. And essentially it's a turnaround. Mm -hmm. So the idea and the name comes of turning property management around. I'm trying to do something different in the property management community. And that's what I wanted to bring in. It also uh, connects my past, my present and my future as well. So it's something that's meaningful to me to acknowledge where I've come from and yeah. where I'm trying to go. It's, it's pretty powerful like to think about it that way because basically just what you're doing is you're putting your history behind what you're doing to change something for the future for the people that you're working with. And property management, why is that? Why did you choose property management as your main source of hustle? Yeah, yeah. I mean, ask me back then uh, if I'd still do it again. I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> Property management, so I actually started as an investor. So mm -hmm. during the pandemic, I started actually buying real estate. My first rental property was bought in 2018. And truthfully, I bought it, had no idea what I was doing, none. Mm -hmm. And I've lucked out with the tenants that I have in that unit. I still have the unit, still have the same tenants. They have been phenomenal. They take care of that unit better than I would take care of it if I were living there. That's, that's how good they are. Yeah. I'm gonna hold on to them as long as I can. But through that journey, and then the pandemic hit, Dance decided to just leave, as it did for many other artists. So I'm sitting there going, what, what do I do? I've looked at different things. I thought about being an agent. I decided, you know what? It's not for me. Mm -hmm. So I said, where else can I make an impact? And then at that same time, got a couple of friends together and we started buying some small level apartment buildings. During that process of learning how to become an investor, buying the buildings and starting to deal with property management because these buildings are not local to Ottawa. They're actually in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm we were interacting with property management. As well, during these investor groups, these inve investor talks, I kept hearing, it's really hard to find good quality property management. Somebody who's reliable, who answers yeah. your call and is transparent and all that stuff that I know many people struggle with. So I'm over here thinking, how hard is it? How hard can this really be? I still believe it's not that hard of a job. There are, there are ups and downs like any job, your good days well, yeah, and bad but days. Like, just like dance, right? Like not everybody can pivot and turn. No, so. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So I jumped in, I did uh, the Algonquin College property management course, mm -hmm. of course, realistically, read the RTA top to bottom multiple times, Property Standards Act, Ottawa City of Ottawa property management bylaw, all of that, know it inside and out. And I said, I'm, I'm going to do this. So I jumped right in. So question, since you've already touched on that, and I was actually segue to my next question, is that a must that you have to have some sort of a background in property management or take a course or what have you to become a property manager? Great question. So yes and no, depending on the type of property management you do. Mm -hmm. So I focus on smaller residential buildings. I don't need any certification, accreditation or anything like that. Mm -hmm. There's of course nice to haves. If I had, you know, a home inspecting background and architecture background, there's always those nice to haves. If I were to manage condo buildings, I'm not able to because I have to have a certain license to do so. I'm not licensed to do that. Yeah. As I grow, I can still do apartment buildings because in Ontario, there is no license for your just your basic residential property management. Anyone can do it. Mm -hmm. But when we get into a situation, anyone can do it, you're going to have bad apples yeah. who really have no Well, business. this is probably one of the reasons why a lot of people were saying, well, there's not many good property management companies out there, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of the issues are the same. There are good companies and they still have challenges. And one of the ones I hear a lot of the time is connection how or, or communication, I should say. How easy is it to get a hold of your property manager? Yeah. How quickly are they responding? Right? When I like I fired two property management companies that were managing my rentals in Nova Scotia, because they were not responding to me, they were doing work on that 
they have we have a, an expense limit they were going beyond that with, you know without getting my authorization without telling me what's going on yeah. and that's not okay anyone in property management who's on either side it needs communication and transparency cool. at the foundation so that's why i said i'm going to come in here and i'm going to do better the baseline of what we strive to do is communicate with our clients if they contact us in 24 hours or less. Mm -hmm. You send me a text, you send me an email, you call me. If I cannot answer right away, I'm gonna respond within 24 hours. Because that's, that's what my clients expect, that's what they should expect, that's what I expect mm -hmm. from my management. Because I'm working for them. And realistically, for a lot of my clients, you know, where I've kind of fell into the niche within property management is the smaller, newer landlords. So they are entrusting somebody with likely their biggest assets. The and, biggest asset. Yeah. And exactly. And some of them, it could be inherited because a family member died. So yeah. there, there is sentimental value, not always, but sometimes connected to those properties. And they just want that reassurance. Sometimes it's just a simple check-in. Sometimes it's, oh, hey, I saw the rent came in. It was a little bit lower than usual. What was that for? And they're not, you know, what are you spending? It on? They just want to know. They just want to be aware of what's happening because, you know, I, I get it you are tr entrusting somebody who you really don't know because like when you hire a property management company how many interactions at the beginning are you going to get mm -hmm. maybe two three phone calls uh you know onboarding and then boom they've got your property it can be pretty quick yeah so let's go back you took the course when was that so that was during the pandemic that was 2021 mm -hmm. so i started buying properties in 2020 end of 20 or sorry 2022 nope i'm having my dates mixed up here 2018 was the first property yeah the actual proper uh, investment was at the start of the pandemic so it would have been 2020. 2021 i'm getting involved i'm saying you know what a lot of those projects by the way i'm more of the general partner as well so i was getting that not hands-on but i was getting that direct leadership experience right from the get-go uh, so 2021, it was May 7th, 2021, I incorporated the business and we've been rocking ever since. Uh, so yeah, I mean, continuing from there, of course, I'm always learning more. A lot of it is learning as you go, but it's always going back to referencing your base foundations. It's the residential tenancies act. Mm -hmm. It's my Bible. You operate within the confines of that, whether yeah. you agree with it or not, we follow what is written. I think you and I were chatting the other day, we we're having a coffee, chatting about the RTA and like where everything fits. And I think one thing that I mentioned was, look, I can, my landlord can ask for whatever the heck they want under the sun to put it in the contract. At the end of the day, RTA trumps it. Absolutely. And that's something that a lot of folks don't know that like, oh, I'm, I'm, I want them to do the cleaning the filter on the microwave or cleaning the filter on the dishwasher or do the snow a couple of times a, a week or remove the, you can ask for whatever you want. It's just not going to happen. At yeah. the end of the day, if they decided not to, it's the RTA that's going to trump it. And the big thing, though, on top of that is there's a lot of ambiguity within the RTA. There's the way it's written. Yeah. Right. So then we have to look at the intent behind it. And furthermore, we have to look at case law. And this is where I like to go above and beyond because I, I really want to know if I'm telling my client something, I'm not going to bullshit them. I want to tell them the truth. And that might mean I need to go and seek out that truth, yeah. which is going to look through previous cases of what judges have determined. And that's, you know, of course, landlord and tenant board cases, but all the way up to divisional Supreme courts to figure out, okay, how was this interpreted? And what does that mean for my case? Yeah. Because it could be, oh, it's written like this, but in reality, you know, it actually could mean this. And the big one that we always get is snow removal. Yeah. Right. That's been back and forth for years. There's been so much discussion about, oh, well, it, you know, it's landlord responsibility, always oh, a tenant responsibility. And only recently have we really started to get some case law around this. So back when I first started the company, I had a different approach, but because there's been more recent case law, I've changed it because of that. So it's just being aware and keeping up with what is happening in that world to make sure we're at the forefront of doing things right, but also then being able to change the way we are managing our units to better reflect well for the audience that are watching we're teasing them with the whole snow removal thing so yeah. let's talk a little bit about <laughs> what is it exactly like what's what's the right and wrong on this so it really has to come down to what is called uh, exclusive use areas okay so when a multifamily building which is where the initial case i can't uh, reference the actual case off the top of my head by name but the initial case that a lot of people were referencing was a case of a, a tenant in a multifamily building who was asked to do snow removal and it was written to their contract 
in the property standards uh, portion of the RTA, there is a section talking about, well, that common spaces are the responsibility of the landlord to maintain. Correct. So you, essentially that was an illegal clause and the tenant brought the landlord to court and well, won. Well, we didn't have anything else to go off of. So a lot f from there, we're like, well, all snow removal is now the landlord responsibility. Or so was thought. And I know there's probably some people going to argue this out there and that that's fine. But there was a lot of ambiguity because we only had this one ruling around it. So even for a single family home, well, what, what's a driveway? What about the front walkway? Well, if the postman's walking up, is it common space? Is it the landlord's responsibility? Is it the tenant's? People were all over the place. Mm -hmm. Some people were saying, no, it's the tenant's. Some people were saying, well, I don't want to get sued, right? You, you don't want to be the person to set the precedent. So, for example, we took the approach saying, great, what it was clear is if we signed a separate contract with the tenant as a subcontractor to do snow removal and landscaping, we're good. The liability goes on to them. We have to pay them, right, to do it, a nominal amount, but we'd set up that contract with the tenant and then we're good. And that's for a multifamily. No, house. that was for actually single family homes. We did that as well because we wanted to play it safe because yeah. there was no clear case law around it. We did it for single family homes as well. Now, more recently, and I don't uh, remember exactly when this case law came out, it was determined because a tenant, that's, you know, tenants read things online and they'll right. interpret it the way they want. A tenant took their landlord to court. I believe it was a single family home saying no snow removal of the front driveway is the landlord's responsibility. Mm -hmm. My argument and the way I discuss it with my tenants is, do you expect the landlord every time it snows to walk through your house, shovel your deck and walk out? No. It's exclusive use, just like you're the only one who can park in the driveway. You're the only one who, you know, you can tell somebody to get off your front lawn or your front walkway if it's your property. You can even tell your landlord to get off your front lawn exactly. if they're showing up at a wrong so time. So, therefore, it is exclusive use and therefore it is the responsibility of the tenant. Perfect. So, now that we have case law backing that up, now we can put in the lease saying snow removal and landscaping. Landscaping was always in there, but landscaping is responsibility of the tenant of exclusive use areas. Yeah. And the fact that we can just we can now put it in there and it's clear and there is no oh but it's it says this it says this there's, there's no argument anymore. Perfect. It's clear. For anyone that's watching do your own research obviously but you heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now with that being said, what does it entail to onboard a landlord and what type of landlords do you normally look for? So I'll answer that question actually with the last question first. Sure. So I focus more on the smaller Landlords, so mm -hmm. newer landlords, typically that they're coming with single family homes, town homes, um, duplexes, triplexes on the lower end. Doesn't mean I don't have some multifamily. It's just I'm not out there searching right now for the 50 unit apartment building. It's a bit of a different approach, or at least I believe it is to property management. We can do it, but the way you manage that large, massive complex is gonna be a little different than you manage Correct. a single family home. So I fell into this actually by accident. It just, I started spending time during my discovery calls with clients and my onboarding, I spent the time with them, these people to inform them, hey, this is what we're doing. This is why we're going to do it. And this is how we're going to deliver on it. And I found the people who were newer, who maybe didn't have the expertise, they really appreciated the time that I spent. I provided value up front instead of just going, yeah, we can do it. We can manage your property. Of course we can, but what's the reassurance? And again, going back to what we said before, or I was saying before, you, you are about to trust somebody with your biggest asset. So to me, it was important to provide value up front. Yeah. So with that, just naturally, the people who were newer, who didn't have the experience, they started gravitating towards my company. And from there, it kind of just, it, you know, word of mouth, you get the reviews and people, oh, that's great, they spend the time and so on and so forth. So single family homes, uh, townhomes, individual condo units and small multifamilies, what we specialize in doing and is most of our portfolio. So we've got about 70 units right now. And I think I've got about 48 owners. So it's very close to a one-to-one -one ratio. You know, I am looking to expand into the larger multifamily, but I'm not rushing into it. I, I know it's going to come naturally as some of my clients buy more, right? Having that exper experience working with myself and, you know, they will turn around and be like, great, we're buying another one. I want you to manage it. Perfect. That's what I want. Now, going back to the onboarding yeah. side of it, so, how do you go about onboarding a client? Typically, it's going to start with a discovery call. From there, it's a big one. Let's say they, they immediately go, yeah, we want to we yeah. go forth. Great. We've got a contract, and I've got a lovely, uh, it's an eight-pager, because 
the contract, if anyone, anyone listening out there, anyone gives you a one or two page contract, run. Run as fast as you can because if someone's giving you a contract, two pages to outline the relationship that you're going to have with them, that's not clear enough. You have to have everything outlined, right? What do you mean? Marriage certificate is only one page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I'm not married yet. What? Um, so. Ooh, she heard yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's great. Been with her for eight years. So that's not how we're not going anywhere. Um, so uh, a contract and then we have an onboarding form. Mm -hmm. So it's part of our website. Instead of the old paper ones, I, I made it easy. It's in our integrated in our website. And it's it's simple. I want to know as much detail about your property as possible. If there's any leases, we have a spot you can upload them. It just makes it easier. We don't have to chase you for it. You can go in, we boom, boom, boom. As long as you enter everything, we're pretty good because yeah. then we can go off. But if you don't, then we're gonna follow up. From there, typically I want a couple weeks. It's not for we can take, you know, take off running from the get-go, but we need a couple of weeks to ease in, to make sure the tenants are aware, because that's a it's a very confusing time for tenants, or it can be. So it's we're going to instruct the landlord, hey, tell your tenants if there are currently tenants, tell your tenants you are getting a management company that they'll be reaching out. This is their name. Then we reach out to the tenants. Then we follow up with the tenants to make sure, hey, you have our contact information. We've got a whole form and document. Uh, you know, for them to make sure they have our contact information. We get them on loaded, onboarded with our app, all that great stuff. And then at the end of the month, so let's say it's about three weeks, which is ideal. We're going to follow up again, making sure they know where to pay rent because that's a big one. If, mm -hmm. if there's any hiccups with onboarding, it's usually where does rent go? People end up paying the old landlord. They didn't know where to pay it. So that's usually one of the biggest pain points is where's rent gone? Um, so that's, that's a typical onboarding. It's a lot of the times at the beginning, there's a lot of back and forth, making sure that we've got everything we need. We want to do it right. So I will spend the extra time up front, make that extra phone call, send those extra couple emails to make sure we have all the information right. Hey, was this, uh, you know, supposed to be like this? Because we walked in, we did a, you know, because part of the onboarding, of course, we're going to want to see the property. So I want to yeah. go take a look. And there's little, there's nuance to every single property. So we might show up and, Hey, is this supposed to be like this? Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to tell you. This is you know, this. Cool. Now we know. Without us going, we had no idea. So within those two to three weeks, that's typically what we're doing. But onboarding is not, at least for the properties that we manage, it's not. It's a pretty quick process. We get you in, and then we're we're off and running. Um, larger properties, yeah, it takes a little more time mm -hmm. because there's a lot more. You've got more documents. You got to follow up with a lot more tenants. Ideally, then we want a few extra weeks, but. We, usually in that case, and you might have snow removal contracts, landscaping contracts, uh, yeah. garbage removal that we want to either transfer over to our name, whether the landlord's keeping it, or we, all those extra things to figure out. So in those events, I guess that leads me to the next question. Would you transfer it over to your names or is it something that would potentially just still be under the tenant or the landlord, yeah. but you're paying it out of a different account or something? Great question. There's always wiggle room, depending on the landlord. Mm -hmm. What do they, you know, for example, some of our properties or my properties in Nova Scotia, we actually are the ones who are paying the garbage removal. It, we set it up from the get-go. The original property manager was like, no, I don't do that. So of course we didn't have a choice. But now with the new company, we're already set up and they just turned around and said, you know what? Why do that extra step? As if you're okay, keep paying it. Cool, doesn't matter to us. And I'm the same way. The only thing that I tell my clients is if we're not paying it, I cannot do the accounting for it. Because if it's not coming through our books, I'm not going to add something that doesn't actually happen. Mm -hmm. If you wanted for us to record the accounting, it's got to come through us. So that, that's, that's all it is. Yeah. But otherwise, I, it doesn't really matter to me. If you want to keep the garbage removal, hey, it means, though, if there's an issue with it, I got to contact you. So I'm very clear with what that could mean. Thankfully, garbage removal, it's usually not an issue. They're pretty, you know, every three weeks, you know, as long as there's a car not blocking the driveway or something, you're good to go. I would say it is a preference for things to be transferred over because then we can control the issues if, let me rephrase that, when they come up. Because it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Yeah, at the end of the day, like it's all those services are delivered by human. We are bound to have mistakes, bad days, good days, yep. you know, and, and especially with something like garbage, right? Someone can be in the way, someone can, you know, a car can get hit, something like that, that you're going to be responsible for it. You're yep. the face of, of the landlord in a yep. way. 
So with that being said, we touched a little bit on accounting. Tell me a little bit more about that. What does that mean for you guys? What does that mean to the landlord? How do you communicate that? Yeah. So that that's a big one is because as we talked about before, entrusting somebody with this large asset, well, now you're also entrusting them with your money or their money, I should say, right? Because the money comes into us. So cool. What stops us from running away with your money? Well, for me, it's I take pride in what I do and I want to deliver a quality service, but we need to account for every cent. Accounting has to be always first and foremost. Mm-hmm. I'm going to kind of dance around the question and then get back to it if you don't mind. So part of uh, you know, being a property manager, I'm a part of different groups. And I remember hearing one, uh, one conference or one meeting is, you know, we are actually a maintenance company first and foremost, because what are we dealing with most of the time? It's maintenance issues. Yeah. So as much as accounting is important, it is very much so. But I actually go from the perspective we're a maintenance company first, and then we are an accounting firm second. So that's it, it's still very important. But the approach and the mindset is, you know, I'm not the accountant. I have somebody to do it because it needs to be done right. So with the accounting, we collect the rent. It's going to go into a, an owner's account. From there, of course, we're going to deduct our management fee and any expenses from the previous month. This is where things can get a little tricky for some people to understand. Yeah. From there, the rest of the money gets dispersed to the owners. Now, you know, we have our our deadlines by the middle of the month. Typically, we don't take that long, but it's one of those things that if banking holiday falls in, you know, right when we want to usually start disbursements, well, then it delays everything. And that's always frustrating for some people, but there's nothing we can do about it. On top of that, then we have a variety of reports to turn around and say, okay, this is what we spent the money on. You're basic. You've got your, your balance sheets. You've got your income and expense. You've got them for us, the software we use, Buildium. And I know it's a very common software actually in the Ottawa community with a bunch of uh, property managers out here. So it's pretty common. If you've been with another company, you've likely used the software. Um, and it allows us to turn around and give you monthly reports. And actually for us, all the reports are available online 24-7. Mm-hmm. So let's say you're going and living in Dubai right? There's a big time difference. Maybe you are checking your account at two in the morning, our time. Cool. Everything's there, right? You can download the report, send it directly to your accountant come tax time. You know, there's so many reports. I actually, I don't even utilize the system as fully as I could, but I actually don't need it yet because we can go down to the unit level. We can account for, Hey, unit one, there was plumbing unit two, there was nothing. Right? So then when owners go on, they can say, okay, we had June, okay, there was plumbing bill, okay, $400, let's say, I'm just using easy numbers. There was, uh, you know, some supplies, okay, you purchased whatever, there was that, right? So we, we divided by the line items because it's not as simple as we spent $600. Okay, on what? Explain yourself. Exactly. So I want it to be clear. We spent $14 on postage because we had to mail you something. We spent $27 on a door handle. We spend $250 on a plumber. Want to see the breakdown? Because this as well allows us, both as managers, but then as owners to turn around and be like, hold up. This unit here, unit one, there's a lot of expenses and they keep, there's always something. So what's going on with that? Is it a tenant issue? Is it a building issue? Does that mean, okay, now we need to look at that unit. When was it last renovated? Maybe it's getting on in time. So we can also look, is there a larger issue? So there's a lot more to the numbers than just how much do you make. It can actually give us an insight to the performance of a property and potentially then any troublesome tenants. Because, hey, these guys keep, you know, I'm usually going to have a much a larger heads up because I'm the one interacting with the tenants. But from the owner's perspective, they're not going to hear a lot about the day-to-day, oh, so-and-so called me, right? That's what you have property management for. But the numbers, you can start to see, okay, there's a lot going on here. You might want to call us. Now, typically, I'm going to try to, call you in advance and say, hey, guess what? We're starting to see something here. So we need to have a larger conversation. Whether yeah. that's next time this tenant moves out, we're going to recommend we, we do a full renovation of this unit because it's just it's costing you money. It's falling apart, right? Renovate it, bump up the rent, decrease maintenance costs. It's a win-win. And then you've, you've done some forced depreciation, which is great. Mm-hmm. So what does it take to be like a successful property management here in Ottawa? In your opinion, what does that look like? I'm going to go back to what I've tried to bring to it. Robust communication and transparency. That has been some of the pain points for some of my clients. Yeah. And it's spending the time with them. It goes back to the type of clients I work with. It's sitting there on the phone, 
for an hour. And some people won't do it. And that's a lot of time. I get it. But especially up front, spend the time with them. Explain to them what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And how we're going to do it? Because truthfully, we do all the property management companies. We do a lot of the same things. It's the nuance that how we do it and how we conduct ourselves is why people are going to choose us versus somebody else. And, you know, for example, I'm not trying to be the cheapest out there. I'm not. We're priced competitively, but we're not trying to be the cheapest out there. And I tell people that from the get-go, I'm not here to be the cheapest. I'm here to deliver a good quality service, and that costs money. People like that honesty. They like that frank conversation because then they, they know what we're about and then how we're going to conduct ourselves. Mm-hmm. So it, it, that's, to me, what it comes down to. That's what we've built our success from. Yeah. Because a lot of it, you know, I'm not going out there. I'm not soliciting, oh, come, come to us and whatnot. A lot of our clientele has been organic growth. And that comes to the quality of service we provided. I've had tenants, tenants come back. They, I had one tenant leave. They actually came back and said, hey, we want to rent from you again. I go, oh, great. That's what I want to hear. Some of our reviews, and I'm, I'm so proud of this. Some of our reviews online are from tenants. Yeah. And not bad reviews, and good reviews. That's a big one too. Like it's a... That's a big foot to fill and it's, you know, the tenant giving you good feedback because at the end of the day, we all know all tenants are going to complain no matter what. A hundred percent. And when are they more likely to complain or when are they more likely to leave a review? Is right after they leave and they're pissed Something's off with bad. You. Exactly. So the fact that we've had tenants turn around and give us a positive review. Yeah. That, that's a feather in your cap for sure. Uh, because at the end of the day, I have two clients, realistically. We have our owner clients but we have our tenant clients too because without good quality tenants, we will not have a successful rental property. Mm-hmm. So we have to take care of our tenants. Yeah. We have to respond to them. And I like the, the fact that you call them all a client because at the end of the day, like you're definitely dealing with both sides of the coin, right? Like you've got the, the landlords that you're delivering a service to yep. that you want to have that you know clear communication, make sure that their assets are protected. And then the tenant on the other side where they are looking for a premium service, which is a very nice, clean, happy uh, enjoyment of property yep. that you've got there. So both sides, you're, you're kind of in the middle. Yep. You're squeezed on both ends. Yeah. And sometimes it's a tough position to be in, yep. absolutely, because, hey, we don't want to spend the money. Hey, we don't want this or we want this, right? And that, that's always a tough situation to navigate. Yep. And that comes down to people skills. If you don't have people skills, don't get into this industry. It's, it's you know go into more of the financing aspect yeah. of it. And, and this is where a lot of, like I find a lot of property managements do end up completely failing because of the fact that it's, again, two sides of the coin, that you've got to, because you're trying to please both sides, you end up lying to both sides just as equally sometimes. Yeah. This, I'm going to say, called this game of property management, it's all about relationships. Mm-hmm. And yes, we can disagree, but when we have tenants who are being difficult, because we do have tenants that are difficult, right? We have to maintain a professional and positive approach because at the end of the day, there's always an opportunity to salvage that issue and turn around. We had this recently. We, the tenant was so unhappy. They just moved in. There was an issue with the door and they were, they were being very aggressive and very demanding. We want it fixed right now. I'm like, guys, this is not an emergency. We will get somebody out there. We actually responded the next day to initially deal with, there were two issues. We dealt with one right then and there. The other one we had to come back to, but they were like, no, I want it done now. I'm like, guys, take a breath. And they were threatening to bring us to the landlord and tenant board over a door that did not close properly. Mm -hmm. The end of it, because we track, we track everything. They ended up giving us a five-star review on the quality of service that we provided to the maintenance repair. Yeah. Every situation is salvageable. Well, sometimes I'm it is the greatest opportunity when someone is pissed off at you because they're giving you that something to work with. Yep. You know, like before the quiet, you don't hear from them. It's all good. That's not a chance to interact. But when there's a chance to interact, especially when they're really pissed off, that's your time to shine. Yeah, exactly. Simon and I can talk for hours. Really no appreciate kidding. you coming on the show. Thanks uh, for having me. Love to hear more and more about your success, man. You guys bring a lot of value to the city. Uh, a lot of your landlords are speaking highly of you and really appreciate that. So, For folks that are watching, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe if you like what you see. Uh, If you have any questions for for Simon, drop it in the comments. I can deliver and have him give you a call. I promise you on that. Uh, And he's really good to to get back to. Communication is his number one goal. Uh, 
Um, and for, you know, to get more and more episodes like this, hit the subscribe button and we'll see you. Thanks again. Appreciate it, Simon. Thank you.